Well, greetings, everyone. It's the Monty Man here. And before we get going with this week's show, I want to let you know that we have now made available to you once again the PDF file of the Emotional Recovery Inventory form. And uh, that is the form that goes along with these shows, Step by Step Towards Emotional Sobriety with Dr. Alan Berger. How do you get it? Simply go to take12radio.com, click on the banner that says Recovery Workshops, and then click on Step by Step Toward Emotional Sobriety. There you'll be able to download uh, all the step by step shows uh, as we uh, bring them back to you every week. And click on the PDF file, Emotional Recovery Inventory form, and then you'll be able to follow along with us uh, and fill that out as it relates to each broadcast when we do use it. All right, without further ado, uh, by much request by many of our listeners, bringing back this uh, incredible series, Step by Step Toward Emotional Sobriety, uh, here we go with Dr. Alan Berger and myself, and in this show... Special guest, our good friend Mason. On this episode of Step by Step, this one is entitled Emotional Sobriety Inventory. The views expressed on this broadcast of Step by Step Towards Emotional Sobriety with Dr. Alan Berger do not necessarily reflect those of Take 12 Radio, KHLT Recovery Broadcasting, or our affiliates. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. And now, here's your host, Dr. Alan Berger and the Monty Man. Well, greetings, family, and welcome to another fine episode of Step by Step Towards Emotional Sobriety with your guest, our guest host, Dr. Alan Berger, who's on the phone. Mason is joining us in the studio uh, this week. How you doing, Mason? Hey, how's it going? The week? I thought it was just the day. Or for this day. I mean, <laughs> yeah, but this show lasts for a week. Oh, and then we go oh, 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 okay. It, yeah. it broadcasts Sorry every Saturday. <laughs> yeah. uh, Dr. Berger, Mason, Mason, Dr. Berger. Hi, how's it going? Hello, Mason, and hello, Monty. It's good to be on the air with you again tonight. Now we have uh, we we have been unpacking up to this point. We have been unpacking uh, a letter that Bill Wilson wrote. Uh, let's just review that really quick. Let the listeners know what we have done. Right. So th- this letter that Bill wrote was actually published in a 1958 grapevine, and it was published under the title "The Next Frontier: uh, Emotional Sobriety." And the letter was originally, uh, or the the article that appeared in the grapevine was originally a letter that Bill wrote to someone who was depressed in the fellowship. And Bill tried to share with this individual what he had learned about his own depression, what was causing it, what, uh, and what more specifically what he could do, or more importantly, what he could do to you know, deal with the depression. So what Bill shared with us was, uh, to me, you know, I've called it the fourth legacy, Bill's fourth legacy in the program, Monty. You know, the first legacy being the steps, and the second being the tradition, and the third being the uh, general service office. Well, this fourth legacy is all about emotional sobriety and what it is. And what Bill realized in the work he had done is that his problem, his reactivity, his depression was called by what he called absolute dependence on people, places, and things for his security and his prestige and the like. And that's a quote from the letter. So what he what he saw was that because he had taken, this is my words, his emotional center of gravity, mm-hmm. he had removed it from within himself, and he had placed it outside of himself in people, places, and things, that those things had to go the way that he wanted them to for Bill to feel okay. And when it didn't go the way he wanted it to, or when those things didn't go the way he wanted it to, then what he did is he got angry. He got mad at the situation, tried to manipulate those people or or that thing or whatever to go his way, and and this is what he realized, is then when it didn't happen, when defeat came, so his depression came. And so when he was defeated, all he could do is feel depressed. And he didn't have any way of doing what we've been talking about is holding on to yourself. 
being able to keep his own shape regardless of what was happening outside of him. So this was an amazing, powerful, powerful um, insight that Bill had. And what we've been doing is, is going through that letter, you know, in, in several, I think we had about 12 different sound bites, and we looked at what this letter was teaching us. And one of the things that it, Bill was really advocating is that we had to unhook this fatal depression, or this fatal dependency, I should say, on others. Mm-hmm. And he gave us a formula on how to do that. He said that if we look at every situation where we get up that, whether it's a big deal or a little deal, that we will find at the source of this is our unhealthy dependence and its consequent demands. Well, that became the whole focus of my second book with Hazelton which was titled 12 Smart Things to Do When the Booze and Drugs Are Gone. And what I decided to do is to use that to help people to, and this was the first of the 12 smart things, is to do an emotional sobriety inventory. And that's what we're going to be talking about tonight, is how to take what Bill said and turn that into a form that we can use to start to gain some awareness and some insight into how we're reacting. So let me go over that form, and I'll just remind the listeners that this form is going to be available on the website. Monty's going to make that available. You can also send me an email address if you want to get it from me directly at abphd at msn.com. So here's the form. It's got five different columns, and I'm going to read to to you those columns, and then I'm going to explain them a little bit. And then Mason has volunteered... (laughs) <laughs> to be our subject tonight. Yeah. And we're going to have Mason do, do one of these things and help him kind of unpack it and process the whole thing. So let me start. The first column is to write down some upsetting event. So what you're going to be doing, Mason, yes. and those listeners out there that are going to be uh, also doing this, is anything that's happened in the last few days that upset you, regardless of how big an event that is or how small of an event that is, is write that down. And describe it in quite deal. What happened? What was it that upset you? So that's the first thing that you need to do on this inventory form, is to write down the upsetting event. Okay, so the second column that we're going to get to, and while I'm talking about these other columns, Mason, you can go ahead and start writing down what you're I already started. <laughs> All right, good. You already got it. Good, good. So then we'll get move to the next column. The second thing we want to do is look at what your reaction was, how you responded to the situation. So you, in the first one, we talked about what happened. And now, in this second one, is how did you react to it? Did you get mad at the situation? What did you say? Did you withdraw? What were you thinking or feeling? So we want you to elaborate on what your reaction was to whatever that upsetting event was. Okay, I got the second call down. Yeah, I'm 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 writing one up too here. <laughs> okay, great, great. We'll have we'll have two great examples tonight. Now, you guys aren't going to be able to do this yet, but I'll help you do this as we process one and two. But the third column is to identify the unenforceable rule, demand, or claim that was underlying your reaction. Now, the way that people can can understand or identify, I should say, their unenforceable rule is to answer the following question. You know, let's say my wife, well, I'll give you an example of, uh, I just recently spoke up at uh, Saskatoon, Canada, and I was working with the uh, Association of the Addiction Professionals Association of Saskatchewan, Canada. (laughs) And one of the young men came up, and I was teaching them how to use this form with their clients, and he came up, and this was the upsetting event he wrote down. When he got home from work, his, uh, he got really upset because the dishes weren't done. So he'd look at the, he'd walk in the house, he'd see the dishes weren't done, and he'd be upset. What was his reaction? Well, his reaction to it was he'd pout. So he'd go in the next room, he'd turn the TV on, he'd start playing games on his phone, thinking that he's going to really show his wife how unhappy he is. Right. So he withdrew. So what was his unenforceable rule? Well, he stated that when he grew up, that what his mother did all the time was to keep the kitchen clean. And this was the way that she showed that she cared. So for him, his unenforceable rule was 
in order to make me feel loved by you, you have to do the dishes because I told you that's important to me. And so mm. if I told you it's important to me, you've got to prove that you love me by doing what I tell you is important to me. That was his unenforceable rule. So that's what we're looking for in this third column. So if he answered the question, well, what should she have done all right, to make him feel loved? Well, she should have done the dishes. So that's how we can identify the unenforceable rule. What should have happened so that we felt okay? And that way, then we can turn that into identifying an unenforceable rule. The fourth column is what is the dependency, the unhealthy dependency that underlies that? Well, for him, her behavior, what she did, and whether or not she did things exactly the way he wanted her to, determined if uh, he was going to feel loved by her. So his unhealthy dependency was is that he had a bunch of rules on how she was supposed to behave to make him feel okay. So his good feelings about his connection to his wife depended on what she did. Got it. So that was the fourth column. Now, we've got a fifth column, and that fifth column has to do with holding on to yourself. Uh, at the top of that column, I've got to stay centered, I need to do what? Well, in this case, um, what, you know, what we saw with this young man is in order to stay centered, first of all, he needed to become aware of his rule and unhook it and realize that if he wanted the dishes done, do them your, for him to do them himself. Right. Instead of putting it on her and turning it into a man. He could ask her to do it. If she was willing to do it, fine. But if she didn't do it, instead of him getting angry, if he wanted the dishes done, go ahead and do the dishes himself. And that's what he needed to do. And then he needed to remind himself is that, she doesn't need to show that she loves me by doing exactly what I want her to do. She gets to be her own person in this relationship and demonstrate her love to me in whatever way she does it, which is not going to, you know, follow my specifications. <clears throat> right, right. That, that's that's what the this emotional sobriety inventory form is. So let's go ahead and do one of yours. Who wants to go first? Um, I'm actually stuck on two of my columns right now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've That's got it. Type of in. I get to help on those. That's kind of what I was hoping. Um, you know, um, last week I actually had pretty upsetting four or five different times in the same week. I had a friend promise to come do something and, um, he called, you know, he initiated the contact every time, you know, and, uh, would, you know, invite me to places and things, you know, and I was really desperate to get out of the house um, so that was my upsetting event. And he blew you, know? you off, right? And blew me off, yeah. He, 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 he would, you know... So turn... he promised, he promised <coughs> to do something with you, and he didn't, and he didn't follow through. And didn't follow through four or five different times, and then afterward was uncontactable okay. that night. All right. So. so what was your reaction? Oh, I was really mad, but I also withdrew from everybody, because I was afraid of what my, uh, actions or reactions, you know what I mean? Because when you're angered, you know, you're afraid you might actually, you know have an anger spike and blow up or do something really, really terrible. So I kind of just withdrew, you know, turtle shelled it a little bit. Exactly. So, so you were just trying to restrain yourself and, uh, and you know, not do something that you were going to regret. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, and what was it, were you having any fantasies about this as you were doing this? Were you saying any other things to yourself about him or, um, in terms of what this meant, in terms of how your friendship or how he felt towards you or... Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know what I mean? It hurts. It's painful, you know? You treasure friends, you know what I mean? Like, the ones that, you know, are supposed to be, your, like, your friends, your family, you know, the ones you can confide in or whatever, you know? And so it was definitely, it was painful, you know what I mean? It was it hurt more than anything, and that's why I was so angered. You know, I couldn't handle that emotion i guess did you think that he did that he didn't uh give a rip about you yeah exactly you yeah. know what i mean that's what hurt that's what's the pain i mean the part that's mad is that you're you know it's selfish you know but you wanted to go do these things you know you know with him you know but uh you know it's probably true that maybe i just wanted to go get out of my house as well you know so that might be the selfish part but uh you know but yeah of course you know there's definitely a lot of hurt feelings you know because it's like how can a friend want to be that way towards me you know what i mean mm. you know what i mean it feels like I don't know, the shark bit you or something. You know? So if you were really a friend, you wouldn't treat me like this, so yeah. you must not be my friend. Exactly, especially four or five times. <laughs> four or five different times. All right. Yeah, I know. Put the unenforceable rule, and then we'll get back to that four or five different. 
So what do you think the unenforceable rule is that you have on her? Could you identify it? Or? Yeah, I mean, you call and you cancel, you know, or you do some, you know, at least make it up somehow. If you can't communicate, then do some so, something. I mean, there's no possible way that there could be no way to communicate when you have you live in the same town. You know, we both live in Albany here, and it's not very far away. There's phone, there's internet, there's Facebook. You know, there's there's possible ways. So you you cancel if you can, or at least make it up if you can't. You know, call if you, you were, That's the way you were raised, right? And yeah, you, yeah. You were raised that make a call for crying out loud. What's wrong with you? You know, yeah. Okay, well, uh, see if this makes sense. Is the unenforceable rule? So my unenforceable rule is that if you're my friend, that you cannot be flaky. Yeah, I, I get. Yeah, I mean that. Hmm. Right, that's the rule. So if you're my friend, it means that you cannot be flaky. You always have to do. Whatever it is you say you're going to do. Yeah. So yeah. I, okay. Yeah, I'm writing that down. That that that, <laughs> that there's this there's this absolute quality to it. So if you say you're going to do something, you have to do that, and you have to in order to make me feel that you're really my friend. So okay, that would be that'd be. So still- the unhealthy dependence is is that my. My my worth as a person depends on how you treat me in our friendship. Mm. If you don't do things according to what I've been, to what you said you're going to do, then I feel like you really don't think much of me as a friend. Okay, yeah, no, I see what you're saying. You see where I'm going with Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so what, all of a sudden, what it starts to become an issue of is because... It becomes so personal, right? Yeah. That that the rule you have is that you must do what you say. You cannot be flaky, and if and if you are flaky, then it's saying something about me. That somehow so, I'm not you're you're not honoring me, or so you're not respecting you, me. But basically, he's able to hurt my self esteem by not following through. Is exactly. that what we're saying? Exactly. So oh, ouch! I didn't rule, realize that one. My self esteem is hooked on what he's doing. No, it's true, man. Crazy. Yeah, so, so, so Mason's self esteem is hooked on uh, his friend not fulfilling his expectations of him. Exactly. It and sounds look, stupid, I, though. It I, sounds I, stupid. It's real. It's going to come. It's not like he's he. You know, you pull these expectations out of thin air, Mason. But but here's the other thing: is that when you keep expecting somebody to do something after they've told you four or five times they're going to do it and they haven't done it. Then we go back to that old saying, fool me once. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, it's not quite the same on me. About the second. It was going on for you, but you see why that happened. Yeah, after the second time, it was starting to become expected. You know, I didn't really want to say that, but I mean, it was kind of, you know, you want to have faith in a person. But you see what happens is because you're, you're, uh, there's that emotional dependency thing, you keep hoping he's going to make you whole. Yeah, okay. So that's why you keep throwing the bucket into the, that well, even though the first time you pulled up the bucket, all you had was sand. Because you There's really hope. want that well to have that water so you can be okay. Yeah, that's true. There's kind of that hope in that. But but that being okay is dependent on his behavior. Yeah, and that's that's hard, man. You know? Well, it's it just puts you in a situation where you're always going to be then at the mercy of what other people are doing. I can use that example, right. the same the same example for several different situations with other people too. That exact exact person, you know, I can use that example with, you know, maybe somebody else or another situation, you know. Of with, course you can. Of you know, you can because see, this is what this is what Bill Wilson was trying to help us see. See, when we do step four, right, and we take that inventory, right. what we're starting to do is to look at our basic flaws. Then when we do step five and share it, but more importantly, when we go to step eight, right, and start to look at the patterns in our behavior, well, what everybody starts to identify is, my God, when I started to look at what was it that I was doing that was, what was this affecting? Myself, myself, myself. But what people don't realize is it was affecting their self because they were so emotionally dependent on everybody. Without even realizing it. Because if you were to ask me how important he was to me, I wouldn't have, you know, I would have said he's a friend, you know, no big deal. You know, I never yeah. realized how but much you're right. I was there. You're, and, you know, you used a great word, is that we make, because of our emotional dependency, we make people too important. 
Yeah, without even noticing, you know, if somebody were to ask, like I said, it wouldn't have been a big that, deal if you would have, you would know. notice it. It's an unconscious thing, and a big part of what this inventory is to, is what I'm trying to do with it is help people become aware of things that are influencing their lives that are outside of their awareness. I got a smile on my face, but I'm kind of choking on this one here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it, it, see, that's that's what happens when I when I sit down with people to do this. They get start to get so many awarenesses of how they've taken their emotional center of gravity and put it out there. So let's see now in the fifth column it says now to stay centered, I need to do what? Well, the first thing you need to do is not to take this personally. This has nothing to do with you. It even doesn't have anything to do with his ability to have a friendship. It just has to do with, with him and, and his integrity and his ability to do what he's going to say he's going to do. So would that play a part of, like, kind of six and seven as well, to, you know, you know, be ready to have that removed? And maybe even if you have, you know, spiritual path to have that higher power re- ready to remove it, maybe? That's right. Mean, you can use that. You can use what I'm saying is to realize is that the... In order to be a better friend, what you've got to do is stop taking things personally. Okay. And understand that this has nothing to do with you. This is him. It doesn't reflect on his feelings for you. It doesn't reflect on your worth as a person. All it reflects is that he has a hard time following through and doing what he's going to say he's going to do. And you can even use that in five to bounce it off so when it makes it more apparent, you know, more uh, acceptable, you know. And then in the future, you just need to operate with that understanding of him. So. If he says I'm going to do it, you say, "Well, look, if, if it's great if you can do it. If not, that then you you know then you won't be able to do it." Because I know sometimes you you make offers to do things that you're not able to follow through with. Yeah, that you are that you are more generous than you're capable of following through with. And look, you don't have to do that with me. I'm your friend. You know, if you can make it, you can make it. If you can't make it, then I'll be okay. I'll figure out something else. All right, on man. Yeah, I'll see what I can I'm do. Here with by this. this time, then I'm going to go do this. See, so you don't set yourself up. Anymore. Yeah, that way, it, you know, you don't kind of wait around waiting for a phone, exactly. you know. Exactly. So. You give him the time that if he's not there by that time, and then you go do what you're going to do. Yeah, right on, man. I mean, that would have helped. You know, I'm s- sort of That's wishing great. I would have known that. You know, it's great. Yeah. yeah. You know, I was kind of complaining here to Monty about it all morning, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, man. And, and if, and if I would have sent Monty this form, he could have gone over this with you a lot sooner, and we wouldn't have this. <laughs> and, uh, I don't want to take over or nothing, um, but I really wanted to, you know, apologize. I saw something. I did this with Monty. I'm realizing, you know, in myself, I'd abandon him, man. A lot of times, I never realized how many times I'd even done that until I realized somebody else did it to me, you know, and how it feels, you know. That's the other part of this is where you start to see one of the things we don't like in other people is the things that we that we do in our, you know, ourselves and that we haven't owned it yet and taken responsibility. So there's a little bit of four, five, six, seven, and eight there. There sure. You in that form. Well, and, and you know, you know, Doctor Berger, when when the reason there was no animals in our neighborhood is because every time Mason did that to me, um, <laughs> I would shoot one of the cats. He doesn't own a gun. <laughs> <laughs> you got a bunch of amends to make to the neighbor. Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. Right. All right. We're going to take a short break. When we come back. I want to read you mine. <laughs> I want to see uh, what you have to say about that. Don't go away. More with Doctor Allen Berger and step by step towards emotional sobriety. When we come back. Hey, check it out. The best in recovery talk and positive music radio is now available on Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Spotify, YouTube, and Podomatic. Simply visit any of these platforms and search for Take 12 Recovery Radio. Listen and download hundreds of our shows for fun and for free. Also available at Take12Radio.com. Okay, um... We're back with uh, step by step towards emotional sobriety with Dr. Alan Berger, and, and uh, we're talking about a some emotional sobriety inventory. Now, if you look on your page here, you'll see a PDF file. It, it'll it'll tell you that you can download this, and then you just open it up. Uh, wait a couple seconds; it'll open up, and uh, then you can just print it out. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if you're like me, you're going to want to print out several. <laughs> <laughs> and listen, and what I encourage, listen, this is not copyrighted. You can Xerox this, pass it out to other people. This is open resource material. Oh, excellent. Share it with whoever you excellent. want to. I mean, it, it's our gift to you. Okay. Um, here, here's mine. Upsetting event, great or small. My son Cameron uh, 
he lives out of town. I knew it would be this. You knew it would be this, did you? He lives out of town, and we just, I mean, it's not that far. It's an hour away, but just financially, we just don't have the ability to see him like we'd like to see him. And um, I found out because Cameron's brother, Colin, is my, is my little informant. Colin happened to be at the mall today, and guess who was at the mall as well? Cameron. Your son. My son was there. And so Colin calls me up, and Cameron's like, don't call Dad, don't call Dad. And and Colin called me, of course. Cameron is in at the mall. I said, well, is he going to stop by and visit? No. And I'm like, what? And and he's he's with his buddy that, that just is on leave from the military and one of his other buddies, his two best friends. And Cameron just, he wanted to come into town and not have to worry about anything except for having a good time with his friends. Something I wasn't getting when this first happened, of course. So my my uh, my thing was, um, the event was Cameron is in town and he has no intentions of visiting us. My reaction to that was I felt unappreciated and I felt a little betrayed. You know, I was like, what? Are you kidding me? You know, and I wanted to grab the phone and call him and say, what, what do you mean you're not going to come visit us? What's what's going on with you? Um and you know my <clears throat> my unenforceable <laughs> demand uh, was that when you, when you come into town, you need to visit your mom and dad every time. Mm-hmm. You know because see, Cameron, this this is brand new to us. This, he's our firstborn. Um, he's newly married. Uh, you know, we're still kind of we're still kind of. You know, there's a little bit of an owie there still from, you know, the natural grief process of your son moving on and that. So we're reeling from that just a little bit, which is natural. But my unenforceable rule is this is what you need to do. This is how I was raised. When you come into town, you see your folks, mm-hmm. you know, and, and if you don't, it means that you aren't honoring them. Yeah. Um. And, and and of course my unhealthy dependency and see if I'm on, right on the money on this, my my self worth as a dad is like okay what what have I done did I do something wrong did I did I teach him wrong what what's he doing mm-hmm. you know and so I felt kind of you know oh kind of crappy to tell you the truth about it all so, so that's the unhealthy dependency part is what yeah? we're talking about now is that that my self esteem. You know, what kind of a father was I for him to behave this way? And and what is the and, and the quality of the relationship? Right. In some way depends on his behavior. Right. Exactly. Exactly. See, that, that's the important thing to realize is that is that the quality of the relationship and how close we feel and how together we feel depends on what he does or doesn't do. Well, and, and here's here's something that happened. I mean, and I'm not saying this happens all the time, but this process happened pretty quickly because I, I, I reflected, and maybe this is something that helped me stay centered with this, is is I reflected on when I was, you know, I was, I was an only child, and so it was really important for my parents if I stopped by. But I remember coming home from college, and wanting to visit with my buddies in Petaluma, California, and I didn't want to stop by the house because I knew what that meant. It meant that I was going to have to be there for at least a couple of hours. Mom's going to want to cook me something. Blah 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 blah. You know, and so you know, I, I quickly was able. You know, I, I I told Mason. I said, I get, I get it. I do get it. Um, it, you know, and and then when Marcia came home, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna tell her today because I thought it would hurt her. I couldn't do it. She's my wife. I said, I want to tell you something now. And, you know, but I got to tell you, I get it. I really do. And um, she took it a lot better than I did. <laughs> uh, that's, that's good. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah she, she may not be as emotionally dependent on him in this area as you are. Yeah, well, Cam- Cameron and I are so much alike. And we are so close. Um, that I I can see where there has been emotional dependency uh, yeah. on him. You bet. Yeah. So so let me go through this with you. Let me just sh- let me just go through it. So the upsetting event was that he was in town and he didn't and he chose not to contact you. Right. All right. So your reaction was when you found out that he was there, you got really upset. You got angry. Mm-hmm. 
And all of a sudden, you started to come up with a bunch of shoulds in terms of what he should have done. Yeah. So, see, that's the first thing to realize is that your reaction is to quickly move to shoulds. Mm. You should have done this. You should have done that. And that's the way that you deal with it is by what I would call it starts to shame the other person. Right. Conformity with your wishes. Because if somebody's not doing what they should do, what does that say about them? They're a bad person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or at the very least, he's going to think. And this is, I'm, I'm glad I didn't call him. I'm glad I didn't say right. anything. No, no, him. you're right. Because yeah. this is an example of, you know, had you dumped that on him, now, you know, you're blaming him for what you're feeling and what's going on for you and making him feel bad, which is going to make him want to contact you even less the next time he comes in the town. Yeah. So it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, Man, I don't want to call him dad because he's just going to dump another shit on me. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. So the unenforceable rule becomes one is, is that you must, you must navigate through our relationship in the way I want you to. Mm. I'm writing this down. Which, which you see, that's the demand is that you've got to be the way I want you to be, which leaves no room for him. Right. And see, that's what the unenforceable rule does, is it totally wipes out the other side. So the other person becomes an it. We're not interested in them personally. Well, we're interested in them doing what we want them to do so that we feel okay. Yeah. Yep. So it totally wipes out the other side, and it then takes your side and makes that, like, that's the most important thing to do in the relationship do what I want you to do so I feel okay. Yep. The unhealthy dependence becomes one is my connection to you as a father and my self-esteem as a father depends on you doing things according to my rules. Yeah. Yep. That's exactly right. Right. So you see that that the bind that this creates, it's, it's like it's a sticky glue that these unenforceable rules in this unhealthy dependency create, these rules about how other people are supposed to behave so that we feel okay. Mm. So the less, let me put it this way, the, we, and we've talked about differentiation, but our next show next week is going to be all about differentiation. So we want people to really tune in, but we're going to give them a few previews in terms of what this means. So the... The less differentiated I am, the more rules I have on how things are supposed to go. Dr. Berger, tell people what that word means. Well, differentiated has to do with the more... uh, So when I'm connected, the degree to which I keep a sense of myself that is autonomous and separate from you. Right. So it's my ability to connect with you, but still keep a sense of myself at the same time. When I'm undifferentiated, I become fused with you. I lose a sense of myself. See, that's what we're talking about in both the examples you gave and the one you gave, Mason, is that, is that what happens is the other person's behavior determines who you are. Yeah. So you become yourself, your identity of yourself, your sense of self becomes determined by what they're doing. Mm-hmm. So that's the fusion. You follow me? Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. I'm... So the more fused I am, or the less differentiated I am, the more I'm going to have rules on how people are supposed to behave, so that I feel okay, or another way to say it, so that so that I feel a positive sense of myself. Right. Is that really common? Well, I mean, what is that that sense or? Um... I'm thinking of codependency a lot when I'm hearing a lot of this stuff, even though I've never considered... Codependency is a term that came much later. See, this stuff on differentiation was talked about in the 50s. Okay. No, I'm just curious. I'm just questions. Yeah, (laughs) so codependency came along, and they just popularized the whole thing, and they called it codependency. 
I think a more accurate description of it is emotional dependency. Oh, wow. No, that's powerful. Yeah, that's, I agree. That's, I, I, yeah, I can see that in a lot of other see, people that, that I know. So the codependency kind of came up in terms of relationship with someone that has addiction or whatever. But the truth of it is that everybody struggles with this emotional dependency in our society, in our culture. Everybody. Everybody does. Sure. That's why they say, you know, anybody that's in AA or NA could as easily go to Al-Anon and, and get a lot of value on it. Because Al-Anon is really addressing the emotional dependency issue. I've heard, I've heard that more than once, actually, in my recovery time. I've yeah. heard that yeah. a few and times. It, well, it's true, because it's an issue for all of us. And like I said, this is the basic flaw, that if we work the program, starts to become illuminated, right? Mm-hmm. As we work, work through the steps. Now, what people didn't realize is that, and this is why this came later. So remember... The steps were written back in 35, right? Yeah. 12 and 12 and what, 56 was it? Yeah, somewhere around there, yeah. Picked up around 1956, right around the same time that Bill wrote that letter. Wow. So Bill wrote that letter in 56, and when you go into the 12 and 12, you start to see, and you if you reread it after, after our discussion tonight, you'll start to see where Bill is really talking more and more about his absolute dependence. As yeah. As going through the steps. I mean, it's really, I love the 12 and 12. I think it's a great, you know, a lot of people say, well, let's talk about working the step, you know, with the big book, which I'm all for. You know, those are the people say, let's go back to the origins. But if you don't appreciate that in 1956, when you wrote the 12 and 12, there's 21 years of experience of recovery now. And that his ability to flesh out things and to explain them and understanding them has really deepened. And that's what the 12 and 12 is showing us. Let me let me ask you this question. Do you think <clears throat> that that this emotional dependency is one of the reasons why many times spouses, once they've lost their husband or wife, will only live maybe two or three more years? That's right, exactly, because of, of their dependency on that person and they've lost a sense of themselves. You know, this is yeah. why a lot of people have relapsed in the program, Monty, is because, see, when... When my sense of emotional well-being is depending on everybody else, then it's hard for me to, to regulate my own emotions and manage my own emotions well, right? Because I become so reactive to what everybody else is doing. Right. So this is where people then go back to drinking or using because they're trying to deal with the feelings they have that they don't know how to deal with. And then when they come back to work the program, what they've got to do is to start to see, well, look at what was the trigger of this relapse was the fact that I don't know how to soothe myself. See, staying centered has to do with self-soothing. So another way of saying what I said earlier is that the more differentiated I am, we'll also say differentiated means mature. The more mature I am, the more I can soothe myself. So the more mature I am, instead of me having demands, about what you have to do, I have requests. <laughs> right. I'd like you to do this. And if you don't do it, I'm okay. Yes, yeah, so it's like you were telling Mason, he, he could tell his friend, I'd really like you to be able to, to pick me up at, at 9 o'clock in the morning to go fishing. But if, if you can't make it, I, you know, I'll wait till 9.30. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, yeah. I'll wait till, yeah, I'll, take the, I'll wait till, till 9 and then I'm gone or I'm going to go find another way or whatever it is. You see what I mean? Then he's taking care of himself and not setting himself up anymore. And then he could say, because I know you have a hard time calling me if you can't follow through. Now, here's the tricky thing, though, that, that, that uh, because th- th- this is my manipulative uh, uh, character defect here. Um, I might say to Cameron, uh, maybe the next time I see him, hey, buddy, um, when you're in town sometime, um, think about stopping by. If you're not able to, I understand, but it'd be sure sure nice to see you. Now, see, that's the way I, I, I probably ought to say it. But in my oh, mind, right, but that, you're right. That would be a manipulation because when you see him next time, all you do is you see him. You say, "God, so much great to see you." That's all you need to do. I know because <laughs> because, because see, I I want to I want to do like we talked about. Oh man, I just, a light bulb just went on, Doctor Berger. I want to do like what Bill said. The way he was manipulating the St. Francis prayer and learned later that that wasn't going to work. See, and because I can do that. And the big one talks about how we can be really nice too, right? Um, I, I want to say something really nice and kind and understanding to Cameron for the same reason 
that I that I want to say. Well, you butthead. That's right. <laughs> That's why I try and use the big book prayers yeah, once in a while. That's very honest. Yep, right on. That's good, money. <laughs> Can I say something about well, like that? Like I said, the best thing to do there is just when you see him, say, son, it's great to see you. I love you. Yeah, yeah. What were you going to say, Mason? Oh, it was about the St. Francis prayer and Bill manipulating. That's why I try and use straight out of the big book half the time. Or use, you know, uh, a lot of the prayers uh, is the selfish and self-seeking motives. That's the hardest one for me to break, you know? So that's the one I actually have to pray for. So I really love that on the page 86. I think. No, that's a fantastic one. But now understand that a lot of that selfish and self-seeking has to do with the emotional. Dependency. Yeah. And we don't yeah. realize that there is a, you know, it's a spiritual malady with a psychological aspect to it. Exactly. Is there. And see, if we deal with the emotional dependency, we're going to become less selfish and self-seeking. So you need to tackle both sides of the... Now we're going yeah. to be self-supporting, Mason. Yeah, no, I, no, for real. I'm going to support myself and not be dependent on what you're doing for me to be okay. I'll be okay because of what I'm doing, because of how I deal with the situation, so my emotional center of gravity comes back inside me. So no longer is my emotional well-being determined by what you're doing or your friend is doing or anybody's doing. It's determined by what I'm doing. Yeah, no, I'm gonna make a list when I get home. I got a pretty good, I, I got a pretty good idea of a few, <laughs> actually about four I can think of off the top of my head right away. We're gonna take, uh, we're gonna take our last break here, and uh, when we come back, more with Dr. Allen Berger on this emotional sobriety inventory. Don't go away. To inform, inspire, and empower Alcoholics Anonymous sponsorship locally and internationally to be their very best, both personally. And spiritually, this is the mission of RumRadio.org, an internet radio program dedicated to carrying the message of recovery to a world plagued by alcoholism and addiction. Alcoholism and addiction is the number one health issue in our world today, and RumRadio.org is actively participating in the solution. Interviews with a plethora of people sharing their experience, strength, and hope. Live Sundays at 9 p.m. Central Time and rewound again on Saturday and Monday. Tune, Tune in to 12 Step Apology at its best on rumradio.org. Yes, I love that word plethora. Plethora. I love that. I love, see, when I, when I learn new words like, it's not a new word for me, but when I l- learn words like that, uh, th- then I begin to hear them everywhere I go, you know. Uh, and, and so it's a lot of <laughs> I have a lot of fun doing those things. Um, okay, step by step towards emotional sobriety, and it is a step by step process. And, and and a lot of this stuff, uh, folks, we didn't we didn't hear about this stuff in, in a lot of our twelve step support meetings. We really didn't. Uh, we may not have never. Uh, yeah, you, in the you, three and a half years or so I've been attending, I've never heard once the psychological right, side of the right. coin. Uh, yeah, and, and, and they really are married. The solution is married to each other. It really is. And I, so I appreciate uh, so much, Dr. Berger, uh, you coming up with this and, and recognizing this. Let me ask you something. Um, it, it, did, did you, I mean, you're in this profession, uh, and, and we know you've been educated. But we also know that you're one of us. And so did you come um, to a realization of what Bill was trying to bring across as something you were applying in your own life? Yeah, you know, I think it happened both ways, Monty. I mean, I think that through the years, because I've had some amazing mentors, um, Dr. Walter Kempler, who was a pioneer in family therapy, was one of my mentors. Dr. William Rader was another one of my mentors, a brilliant psychiatrist. I mean, both of these individuals helped me start to realize a lot of the uh, these psychological things. Now, I think my education, you know, I went to University of California, Davis. It was top drawer, great program in clinical psychology there. I was in the uh, uh, Department of Medicine. We were a graduate group within the Department of Psychiatry, a very special program. So I've had a lot of good training through the year. But what really was interesting is because I was also on my own path in my recovery, as I started to see these psychological concepts, and this is what we're going to be doing in, in next week's show, we're going to start beginning this process. I started to see how these psychological concepts could help me understand what I was experiencing in my recovery. And
And not only did they help me understand it, they started to enrich and deepen and and really create an amazing understanding and foundation of what was happening for me and what my experience was about. Mm -hmm. I know you're going to be having a show, you're going to be talking with Dee McGraw, they have this great conference that they're starting on the West Coast called CORE, and it's the Clinical Overview of the Recovery Experience. Well, that pretty much describes what I the journey I've been on the last 42 years in my recovery. Yeah, I mean, it's all about having both this personal, spiritual experience and at the same time having all of this psychological information so I could start to integrate the two. And if there's any contribution that I think I'm making is really integrating these psychological concepts with the 12 steps and helping people see that there is a very sound psychological basis a uh, lot of sound psychological principles that are operating in these 12 steps. And I, I think that's important for folks that I speak to, Monty, because in the mental health profession, you know, um, they just shudder when they hear the word God, even if we put after it as you understand them. Yeah. I mean, there's been a separation between psychology and theology and, and philosophy now for a long time. Which is interesting to me because I, I've noticed in my own personal faith um, that that in in my faith and and with and and science and psychology they they really do mesh. No, I've got something to say on that one too. I'm sorry, I apologize for jumping. No, that's okay. Again. Go ahead, man. No, go ahead, money. No, I was just I was just saying they they really do mesh uh, uh, much more than people want to even consider sometimes. No, it was something I realized. You know, it's like. Um, I was kind of having some thoughts and some uh, emotional stuff, and I realized um, I've been praying and doing everything right, you know, as far as my uh, spiritual walk. And my physical condition is just emotionally just, it, need, it needs fixed, you know, it's just distraught. But it's like the other on the other side of the coin, my spiritual cup is overflowing, you know what I mean? It has more than enough to take care of a few people, you know, but on the other side, I'm starved, and it's like a desert, you know, like, yeah. So that's kind of the way I've been this is last week. He's actually kind of answered a few prayers, believe it or not. I've kind of, you know, I'm kind of hoping this works out a little bit for me. I'm, I appreciate it. Thanks, Doctor. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah, I'm glad you joined us, Mason. You really uh, made a fantastic contribution to the uh, to the show. Yeah, thanks for letting that, me. Absolutely. And, and I, I think... Uh, you know, we are we are whole beings. We're made up of, of several different things. And I think when the whole person is treated, that's when we see real recovery. That's when we see people right recover. On. That's a great, yeah. great way to uh, say it. Yeah. All right. Any final thoughts for this week? I'm sorry, say that again, Mike? I said any final thoughts for this week. Yeah, the only thought I'd like to leave people with is that, look, this is a, a process. You'll get better and better at this as you do it, you know, just like... Um, anything else. So what I would say is practice and practice and practice doing this inventory. Mm -hmm. I see this inventory is a part of what we can do in our step 10. When we are doing a spot check inventory, we can go through this and try to identify what our demand is and what our unhealthy dependence is and then clean it up and, and to make amends for that when it's appropriate. So this this is the, a tool that I can I think that we can use to enhance in our recovery. Yeah, it, it, it's excellent. I, and I'm sitting here. I'm looking over it to my left. I have a, a dry erase board that's not hanging on the wall. And I'm thinking maybe I'll put this on my dry erase board. <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> yeah, 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 it really is. Um, what a cool thing! And this is so great. Uh, Dr. Berger, thank you so much for uh, uh, another fun oh, you're show this week. You're welcome, and looking forward to next week's show. And just everybody join us, and uh, you'll get a uh, uh, an education about this whole process of differentiation. Right. See how important it is. And, and folks, uh, go ahead and click on the PDF file and print it out. And it's it's black and white, so there's no color. You're not going to soak up a lot of ink or anything. Uh, if you want to, some people don't even know this, but you, you can set your printer to print out like a draft. And so it's, it's not using up much ink. Uh, and you can print this thing out uh, and then fill it out and, and rewind the show and listen to it again and fill in uh, your own event and your response to it and your your um, unforceable rule and, and unhealthy dependency and what you need to stay 
uh, uh, centered. Uh, and it really, Dr. Berger, they're really, especially when somebody's doing this for the first time, there's no wrong way to do this, right? There's no wrong way to do it. You just do it. And if you get stuck, you can contact me directly or you can contact Monty. Pick up my book, 12 Smart Things to Do When the Booze are, and Drugs Are Gone. It's on Amazon or Hazleton. And that will also guide you through it because, I, you know, I give a lot of great examples in the book as well. ABPHD.com is the website. And you can email Dr. Berger at ABPHD at MSN.com. Uh, the links are right there on our main page, or excuse me, on our, on our page uh, for Saturday. Remember, we uh, now have available for you, particularly for those of you who have smartphones, uh, a download MP3 link that doesn't go away after a week. It, it's up and it stays up. And uh, so you can go back and check all these shows if you're one of those smartphone people that uh, rather not use a, uh, a PC or an Apple. Uh, maybe you have a tablet that will work fine with that as well. Thank you, Dr. Berger, once again. You're welcome. Uh, it's welcome. Great. And Mason, great, great joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was awesome. Uh, I appreciate it. Fantastic. And Monty, as usual, it's been great. Uh, all right. Stay on the line, folks. Don't forget our email address, take12radio at comcast.net. We're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Google+, Plus, YouTube, and whatever else we can get our hands on. <laughs> Until next show, this is the Monty Man along with Dr. Allen Berger and Mason. And we're wishing God's perfect serenity for you. Bye-bye now. This has been a broadcast of KHLT Recovery Broadcasting.